Welcome to Vallejo Drive, Seventh-day Adventist Church today in our Divine Hour worship service. We want to invite you to join me in this call to worship. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into the courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endureth throughout all generations.
invite you to stand with me for our prayer of invocation. O oh, gracious God, we thank you for inviting us into your house of worship and prayer and praise today. We now invoke your presence in a mighty way to be here with us. Commission those same angels who hung around the cross to be in this place today. And may we, as we leave this place, declare surely we have been with Jesus and it has been good to have been here. I pray in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Please remain standing as we join our voices to sing The Lord is My Light, hymn number 515, The Lord is My Light.
Well, good morning and happy Sabbath, church. It's good to see you all here today. How's your year so far? Well, you know what they say. I was doing some research this week, and apparently the third Monday in January is officially the most depressing day of the year. So I think that was January 15th last week. Um, and I guess the reasons are like the weather tends to be bad, your debt level, it is an all-time high because of all the money you spent over Christmas. Uh, Christmas is well and truly over, and all the resolutions that you decided to make, now is about the time that you've realized you've, you can't keep any of them. So they say that it's the most depressing day. And that's not to get off to a negative start. I think it's good news because it means that if you guys all got through uh, last Monday, then you've already seen the worst of the year and things are going to be a lot better from now on. So, so well done. Now, a lot of announcements to tell you about today. Uh, so try and keep track of all these. I think it's a good thing that we have a lot because, you know, busy church is a good church, right? So we have Koinonia, which continues. That's our Wednesday night meeting, our prayer meeting at 7 o'clock. Every Wednesday, it takes place in the chapel just over there. We have worship. We have community building. We study scripture. And I think a lot of people who have been coming to Koinonia have found it's really helped them develop their discipleship and, and help them grow in their spirituality. So I really encourage you, if you can take the time on a Wednesday night to come to Koinonia, I think you'll find it a real blessing. Uh, secondly, uh, the group that I'm in charge of is Praxis, and that's a young adult uh, group that meets on a Friday night at 7.30, at 7.30 in the chapel as well. Um, I say it's a young adult group. It's supposed to be 18 to 35-year-olds. I'm actually 37, so technically I shouldn't even be there, and I'm the leader. So really it's a question of how, how young you feel. But do, do try Praxis. Um, there's contemporary music, there's a band each week, we have snacks and food and coffee and fellowship, we have social events and outreach projects that we get involved in. So anyone at all who wants to come to Praxis, uh, 7.30 every single Friday. Now many of you have come up to me and said, you know, why don't we have more social events? So there's even more stuff going on. I can't go through all of them, but if you check in your bulletin, you'll see that we're having a church-wide picnic next week. So bring your lunch, bring your blanket or a chair and join us for that. That's going to be next Sabbath, directly after the service. So if you want to know the details, uh, check your bulletin there. We're also uh, having a new initiative started by the Sabbath School, uh, which is going to be a breakfast uh, every single week. Um, that's a good chance to bring people. So again, bring your friends. Uh, bring your appetite. It says in the bulletin there that it starts next week. It actually starts uh, February 3rd, which is two weeks from now. So again, 9 o'clock in the morning till 9.30, uh, a Sabbath school courtyard breakfast. So I encourage you to come to that as well. And the final announcement, which is really something that's very, very special to me, is that, you know, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we had our young adult band uh, playing on the platform here. That's going to be the start of something that happens uh, once a month on the first Sabbath. We're, we're, it's like a blended service. We're going to have some organ, some choir as usual, but also some contemporary music. A chance for the youth and the young adults to feel empowered. They can get up there, play their instruments, and show you guys what they do and lead you in worship. So I think this is a really good thing, and hopefully this will bring more young people and more young families, and just all of us together to worship in God's house as a family. So we're calling this uh, our family Sabbath, and that's going to be uh, the first Sabbath of every month. So please come, and I encourage you again, uh, bring a friend or two to that, okay? And so finally, it's now the uh, time for the kids to come up for the children's story, and you guys can take this time to maybe stand up, walk around, find someone you don't know, give them a warm greeting, a hug, a handshake. So I encourage you to do that now. Children, please come up.
Good morning, boys and girls. I'm going to talk to your parents really quick. Parents, don't forget, when we do our koinonia on Wednesday nights, um, your kids can come too, and they have their own very special program. We have lots of fun. We do crafts, and we do games, and of course, we learn about a story from the Bible every week. And this, this year, we're focusing on the life of Jesus, and the kids are loving it and they hate it when they miss it, and so I ask that you would bring all of your kids. We want to have a lot more kids at our, at our Koinonia program, so. Okay, that's it. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right, so you guys are all back in school, right? Yeah. Yes. Now, does anybody have an experience with somebody being not so very nice to them at school? Yeah. Yeah, does it make you feel kind of yucky? Yeah. yeah. Does it make you feel like you want to go home? Yeah. yeah, sometimes, right? Well, let me tell you about an experience that I had. Not when I was a kid. I had lots of those experiences when I was a kid, but this was when I was already a grown-up. I had just graduated from college, and I was at my very first teaching job. And there was one class that did not like me. They did not like me from day one. Most of the kids were happy to see me. They would say hi to me every week when they came into my class. But this class, oh, they did not like me. And I had them every single day. And they were not nice to me. And sometimes I just wanted to go home. And boy, I was such a new teacher that I didn't really know how to handle it. So I was strict at first, and I was kind of hard on them at first, and I wouldn't let them get away with anything. But they didn't like that, and they didn't react very well to that. And so I really, really wanted for God to take me back home to where I came from, to Colorado, and I wanted to hide in my room and I wanted to not be around those kids because they didn't like me. But then God told me, just love them. So I did. I loved them, even though they still didn't like me. And you know what? After a few weeks, they started to like me a little more, and they started to listen to me. And they started to not bang their cymbals in the middle of class just for fun. And they started to come around. And they were a lot nicer after that. And you know what? I realized it was because of, of the love that God had put in my heart for those kids. So when you have a problem with somebody and you're just, oh, man, you just want to get away from that person, right? Right? All you have to do is ask God to help you love that person. Love your enemies, God says. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. And um, it's time to go to children's worship. So you may quietly go up to your children's worship. would like to call um, the deacons forward. <laughs> our offering this week is for our church budget. And as we all get ready to reckon with Uncle Sam, let's not lose sight of the fact that the work that we do with our resources goes much further than this world. Our offerings are for the work that we do in this church, but it is much more than that. It's our outreach to um, community, and it is also in support of the World Church because we want Jesus to come. This world every day should be reminding us that we have work to do, and our offerings is a way that we can make that happen sooner. 
let's bow. <coughs> okay. The deacons, you can um, collect the offering, please. and heavenly father we are so thankful for the love that you first showed us that we want to worship you through our offerings and our um, gifts of our time and our tithe dear lord we ask that you will touch our hearts that we will be grateful givers that we will be uh, intentional in how we set our money aside to serve you. Bless the offering that has been collected today, and please multiply our efforts so that your soon coming will be a reality in our lifetime. In your name we pray, amen. Okay. Be seated.
if you have a special prayer request or need, we would like to invite you to come to the front so we can pray with you while we sing. Hymn number 671 as we come to you in prayer. for prayer. Dear most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to meet together as family, friends, and church family here in this place. We thank you for bringing us here today. We ask you to be with your manservant as he gives the word. Bless all of us and help us in whatever that is troubling us, those who are in the congregation, even in the pastoral staff, Lord. We thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here, and we ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. Today's scripture reading is found in Psalm 27, 1 through 5. I will be reading from the King James Version. You may follow the reading on the screens. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Thou war should raise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Today I stand speak as your family pastor <laughs> to struggling and hurting church. 
already going through ups and downs in 2018. And I invite your reflection with me on this simple subject that I've entitled Cravings. Cravings. Just turn to your neighbor and tell them, I've got some cravings. Come on, turn to the person next to you. That's your neighbor and just tell them, I've I've got some cravings. Cravings. Now, 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 turn to your other name and tell them, don't worry, you've got some too. Cravings, cravings. Not even a month into 2018, but many have suffered illnesses already. Southern Californians have suffered recent fires and mudslides and we here at the Vallejo Drive Seventh Adventist Church this past week have suffered the tragic loss of our beloved sister Irma Torres. So in all this tragedy, I just stand to speak these words of comfort and ask you simply, have you ever read a scripture passage that sounds like your story, reads like your reality, Tells like your trial, your test, your testimony, and maybe preaches like your very own paradoxical drama of light and darkness, triumph and defeat. In Psalm 27, verses 1 to 5, I see my life story hiding behind each verse. Can you see yourself in this passage this morning? Just look at the text, look at the text. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom then shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? Aren't you glad you made the Lord your light, your salvation, and the strength of your life already? Go on and say amen to somebody. Say amen to somebody. If I just borrow a couple of amens this Sabbath, I'll give it back to you the next time I preach, I promise. Don't, don't you feel like David somehow stole those words from off your lips? You see, this is my story. This is my song. I, I don't fear anybody or anything because the Lord is my light. But like David, I've got enemies that bring darkness into my life. So verse 2 goes on to say, when my wicked enemies come to devour me, I promise you they're going to stumble and fall. Though a host of warriors gather around to fight against me, and war rises up all around me, in this I will be confident in 2018. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. I told you this is my story, and this is my song. You see, I've got both ups and downs. I've got the Lord's light and salvation shining on me, but I've also got the gloom and doom of dismal darkness cast by my enemies enemies all around me. I've got some friends who will join me in the light of God's love. Oh, but I've got some enemies who come up against me and cause my darkness. You, Pastor Peter? Yes, little old me. I'm too big and bad and bold and bald to have no problems. I got some issues, man. I've got some situations that seem too dark and dismal and difficult for me to handle, but this text assures me that God will hide me in his pavilion. Oh, but don't you look down your noses at me like you just got the Lord as your light and all the time and you ain't got your own darkness. Just go on and, and tell the truth and shame the devil. You know you've got your own darkness here this morning. I, I know that's right because everybody lives with darkness sometimes. Nobody has immunity. All of y'all, everybody in here got your own darkness cast by the enemies in your life. And we may sit up in church with our legs crossed and our arms folded and pretend we got it all going on. But I just stop by to burst your bubble and say simply, nobody's living perfect. All humanity suffers brokenness. Everybody got some issues. Everybody got some ups and some downs. Everybody Everybody got some light and darkness, some friends and foes. Uh, some folks you don't like and some other folks don't, that don't like you just keep coming around and casting their shadow of darkness in your life. You sing that old song, tell me what's wrong. 
with me now. Tell me why I never seem to make you happy. The heaven knows I tried. Now, don't you worry about that. That's old school. That's real old school. That's real that's stylish chicks. And that's, a, that's old school. Y'all don't know nothing about that. But this psalm represents the perfect parody of human life. It details our drama with both light and darkness, good and evil, heaven and hell, life and death. It makes no difference who you may be. The life cup of our humanity never gets filled up. We all face these ups and downs in this new year, 2018. Yet because we trust God's light will dispel our enemy's darkness, our best wisdom says we must press on uh, towards the light amidst the darkness and difficulty and adversity and sickness and death and trials. Don't give up, don't quit, just hold on and endure. Langston Hughes, that African-American poet, said it this way, well, son, I'll tell you, Life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had uh, ups and downs. It's had tacks in it and splinters and boards torn up and places where there ain't no carpet on the floor. Bare, but all the time I've been climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back now. Don't you sit back down on those steps because you find it's kind of hard. Don't you fall now, for I'm still going, honey. I'm still climbing, and life for me ain't been no crystal stair. But I think this psalmist has a far better answer than this poetic advice to press on, hold on, endure, and keep on going. David cries, I, I want desire and crave just one thing from God. I want to move into the temple and live in God's house for the rest of my life and then everything will be all right. I just want to look at God's beauty for the rest of my life for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. When David speaks about his best way to handle enemies and trial, he speaks not of pressing on, enduring, and hanging in there. Instead, he speaks of moving into God's house. He says, I just want to move to the house of the Lord for the rest of my life and spend my days beholding his beauty. And when my enemies come up against me, my God shall hide me. He shall shelter me in his pavilion. Now, 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 as a pastor, I, I confess that I sometimes wish more of our members expressed this craving. Ain't I right, Pastor Mark, Pastor Luke, Pastor Shane? Don't you just wish all our church folk would express this longing, this desire? We just want to fill the house of God. We just want to fill the church house with folks saying, I just ask and have one craving, one thing, just one thing from the Lord that I desire, that I may dwell in God's house for the rest of my life. Sister Mavis, no more trouble getting folks to Sabbath school on time. They'll be living right here in God's house. That's right, standing on the promises while living on the premises. Mm -hmm. I can hear Brother Henry and Brother Bell asking how we going to handle the utilities and how we going to feed all the people. Don't you worry, God will provide. This church will be filled every single Sabbath with folks who came not just to hear the choir sing, not just to hear the organist play the pipes, not just to hear the bell choir chime sweet melodies, not to hear the preacher articulate God's word in order just fellowship with the saints and say happy Sabbath not just to admire the splendor and the beauty of this temple evidence edifice no 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 everybody would just come to gaze upon God's beauty all the days of their life yes they've packed up all their belongings and said we are gonna move to God's house over there at 300 Vallejo Drive Glendale California 91206 I hear them say, I have this confidence that in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. Okay, don't you worry. Don't you worry. I know everybody's staying for the potluck, but after that, we're going to go on home. Amen.
Amen. But you see, this desire, this craving shines gloriously as our answer to human troubles. In this year, this new year of ups and downs, the safest place in the whole wide world must surely be God's house and God's presence. In this year, all of us crave with David God's presence. The majestic glory of God calls us into his divine presence. The desire to be with God tugs the heartstrings of every Christian. The long Longing for God and humanity to be fully united ricochets throughout the corridors of earth's long history and the mission of our church to awaken in every human heart this love and longing and craving lives right here in this passage the hope of heaven the goal of glory the dream of divinity and the will of the worshiping believers the worshiping saints of God lives right here we all possess this one craving to be with God and to behold his glory forever and ever and ever and we confidently trust that he will shield us in his pavilion and that's why this psalm sounds like your story reads like your reality and tells like your testimony almost like David stole these words from all off your lips because all of us have this one craving but you see in our culture we don't say it like David said it we just say I want to go to heaven and be with Jesus amen Isn't that what we say Isn't that how we say it yeah that's how we say it we say I just want to go to heaven and be where Jesus is in fact just about everybody has an obsession to go to heaven and in the time of trouble trouble preacher yeah trouble like temptation trouble and 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 financial trouble and irs tax man trouble and family fights trouble and marital trouble and trouble with in-laws and heart trouble and job related tr jealous work co-workers trouble and church politics trouble and sickness disease and even death trouble in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his heavenly pavilion for all of us trapped in the ups and downs of life in this new year living amidst the lord's light and our enemy's darkness caught in our own purgatorial limbo between heaven and hell stuck down here in this earthly plane of existence we have one craving and longing for our our heavenly home whereby we might escape our enemies we collectively share David's craving as our answer to life's problems we we want Jesus to take us to heaven so all our troubles will end we dream sing and pray about heaven because we crave God scholars say David wrote this psalm while he ran from Saul and he lived an entire lifetime longing to dwell in God with God in God's place and I pondered why didn't God ever grant David's wish and satisfy this craving and longing to move to God's house thankfully I found the answer in the story of David's life indeed David possessed this craving for God's presence and he trusted God to shield him from his enemies but he had other cravings that overpowered this one craving if you review his life story you'll see he craved power wealth fine women and conquest in battle yes he craved God's presence but all he could do was write a psalm and sing this song with that craving he could not turn the craving into a reality why because the path to God's house requires much more than a longing, a wish, a craving for God's presence, and a psalm. Like the African slaves down south used to sing, everybody talking about heaven ain't going there. Hmm? Well, preacher, what does it take to get up into God's heaven? Well, when reviewing David's life story in light of this psalm, I realized he never got to move to God's house and live forever. Yes, he made the Lord his light and his salvation, but his enemies remained and he always had fights. I stayed up all night last night wrestling with the text to find out why God never ever gave David what he craved, residence in God's house and shelter from his enemies. God didn't even let him build the temple of God's house, let alone live in God's house forever because he had blood on his hands. In 1 Chronicles 28 verse 3, God says, you are not to build a house for my name because you've been a man of war and have shed blood. 
And inquiring minds like mine just had to know why, God, why, why? In Acts 13, 22, you called him a man after your own heart. Why didn't you satisfy his craving to move into your house? Why didn't you shelter him in his, from his enemies in your pavilion? I said, Lord, I want to know because God's people want to know. We long to go to heaven and dwell with you and be shielded from all our enemies uh, we, and of sickness and death and evil all around us. So what's taking you so long for you to bring about this salvation? Oh, I wrestled with the text all night long until finally it sat up and it smiled in my face. And I heard God, I heard God's spirit saying, Peter, uh, you need more than a salvation that brings you to heaven. You need more than a salvation that changes your location. You need a salvation that completely changes you. You need more than a light that shelters you from your enemies. You need a light that shelters you from you yourself and moving into God's house and standing on the sea of glass and walking on the, the streets of gold and wearing a long white robe and hobnobbing with the holy angels and fellowshipping with the 24 elders and sitting at the banqueting table and sipping the heavenly champagne may be your wish and your burning desire and your deep craving but it's not the primary goal of the Christian and that's all I came to say this day it may be our longing and our fixation, obsession, and our craving, but it's not our primary goal. Yes, Jesus promised, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And almost every human being says, I want to go to heaven. And we think of heaven as a place of love and joy and peace. And we crave God's glorious heaven as the answer to all our problems and the fix and the cure and the solution to all our ills and we believe God will make all wrongs right up in heaven but God's great goal right now is not so much getting us to heaven but instead it's getting heaven into us in fact getting into heaven won't make much difference for us if God does not first put heaven in us but why, brother preacher? Why, brother preacher? Because even now we dwell in God's presence, yet we struggle. David himself said it in Psalm 139, verses 7 and 9. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand find me. We cannot escape God's presence because we live in it. And so dwelling in God's heavenly abode may look like the answer. But I declare God craves something far more wonderful, far more powerful. Yes, we obsess about heaven and crave God's dwelling place. But God in Christ has already made his dwelling place with us and in us. Oh, this is the gospel. For this cause Jesus came and lived and bled and died. They hung him high and stretched him wide. He hung his head in the locks of his shoulders. And there he cried, it is finished. Oh, but early Sunday morning, he got up from the grave. And he put one foot on death and the other foot on the grave. And he looked the devil in the eye and he said, I snuck into your house over the weekend and I got the keys to hell, death, and the grave. I've conquered every one of your enemies already for you. I've conquered death. I've conquered hell. I've conquered evil. I've conquered wickedness. I've conquered demonic forces. I've solved your problem with your external enemies. But now through the power of my spirit, I come to enter into your life and fix the problem with your internal enemies. And I've got power to change any life. And he comes into our lives to give us that new life. You see, our fixation on heaven might cause us sometimes to miss our real need. We don't need to dwell in God's presence. We need God's presence to dwell in us. David didn't just need God's shielding from enemies around him. He needed God to shelter him from the enemies within him. Those dominating cravings and addictions and fleshly affections, his enemies 
enemies of pride and self and ego and lust and deceit and inauthentic cover-ups and pretentiousness and lies and evil plots. Lord, I need you so much more than to be in your presence, to behold your beauty and be shielded from my enemies. Yes, that's wonderful. And I trust God will do that for me. But I'm so messed up right now that I need God's presence inside of me. I hear somebody here right now crying out, Lord, I need you. Fix me on the inside through your spirit's power. Heal my anger and my hurt and my pain and my brokenness. Lord, I need you. Oh, I'm thankful that the Lord is my light and my salvation. I fear no enemies without me because his light illuminates their darkness. But oh God, the apostle Paul declares in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 6, he says that the God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has now shined that light into our hearts. Oh Lord, I need you to shine that light of your love and glory not on my enemies, but on my dark heart. Oh Lord, I need you because the enemies are enemy. Illuminate the dark corridors of my heart where fear and doubt and pain and resentment and ego and pride reside. Light up and reveal my own enemies of selfishness and arrogance and malice and hatred and covetousness and lust and prejudice and racism. Be the light and the salvation that shows me the enemy in me and brings your healing love, oh God. Help me to know that while I crave to be in heaven, you create to create a bit of heaven in me. I've been in your presence, Lord, so long, but still I'm not changed. If I could get up into your glorious heaven where your residence is, your physical presence will be like a consuming fire upon me. Oh Lord, I need you. If you would just be in me and cleanse me and fix me, Lord, I need you. Come into my life through your Holy Spirit's power and fix me, Jesus. I believe that's the prayer and the cry of every transformed heart. And I just believe that that was the prayer and cry of Sister Irma. I believe she cried that cry. I didn't know her long, but I know she, I believe she cried that cry and prayed that prayer. And I believe God answered that prayer for her and lived in her heart. And her one desire, her craving would be today for all of us to pray that same prayer. Lord, I need you to draw me not so much into your presence, but put your presence into me. If that's your prayer this morning, I invite you to stand with me and join our praise team as we sing this song, Lord, I need you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord. 
change my song to I see you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stay and I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need Thank you, O oh God, that you've promised to come into our hearts. Not just to dwell around us, but to dwell inside us. Not just to fix our surroundings and secure our habitation, but to fix our insides and secure our hearts. And today, O oh God, we, as a wounded, broken congregation, feeling the hurt and the pain of the loss of our dear sister. We come to you, we come to you with an open heart, crying out, oh Lord, I need you. So I pray, oh God, right now that you'll fulfill that promise for each one standing here before us. Come into our hearts, bring your peace, bring your power, bring your love, your goodness, your grace, your glory, and your grandeur into our hearts so that our praise can be powerful and our worship will be wonderful. Because we live with a transformed heart, with a cleansed heart, with a renewed mind, with a strengthened resolve to live for you, to love you, to love every single person we come in contact with. May we be a blessing in our families, at our workplace, at our school, in this church, in this community. May everywhere we go, people encounter a fresh new look at Jesus. I pray now, Lord, that you will be with us. Be especially near and dear to the family of Sister Irma, her husband, her children, her sister, her father, be near and dear to them, O Lord, oh Lord, comfort them. Give them your peace. Bless us now. May we go not from your presence, but just from this place until we come again to worship in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Be seated.